Hello and welcome to our weekly Sunday online from Christ Church St. James, Etobicoke. Very thankful you'd take a few minutes to join us. This little project's been going on since the pandemic began as a means to keep in contact with our friends who normally would come into this place right here, but the pandemic had other ideas. But during that period of time, not only have we been really happy to maintain connections with people we do know, but also to make connections with people we didn't know. And so we're very, really, really pleased and grateful for all of that. So if you're one of those folk, that's, that's, that's lovely. Thanks for taking time with us. And you might wonder what on earth this is all about. Well, it's, um, we've been walking through something known as the Gospel According to John. And it's a biography, a portrait, I like using that word, about Jesus, um, helping us appreciate who he is, why he came, what he did, and does that relate to us at all? How does that relate to us at all? And so that's the kind of questions that are really important to ask as we read the story of Jesus. And then we oftentimes reflect a little bit and uh, maybe a song if time allows as well. Um, and that's about it. And then we also make sure to welcome your input, comments, and also if your, your request, because a lot of folks we discover just haven't got their hands on uh, New Testament or Gospel of John. And we have too many. It's just not right that we would have many and others would have none. So we would love to give them away. So if you would like a Gospel of John, even this one, or one just like it, we got a bunch, at the end of this little video shows how to get a hold of us. And, uh, and when I say we will do it immediately, I really mean, because it's, it's no big deal, just to put this in the mail to you, is our, we, we appreciate that. So don't hesitate, please. And the other, I should just make reference one more time, that sometimes folks want something more than, or in addition to, the Gospel of John, and they like a little help me understand life book, help me understand how, how I might live life and why I'm even here. In fact, the little book is called, um, What on Earth Am I Here For? I, I love this little book. It can be tucked away in your pocket real easy. And there's five big questions in here, five points to help us kind of come to grips with what we're all what we're meant to be all about so again just another freebie and love for that to be yours if you'd like it just going to pray i want to thank you father for this opportunity again i don't take it for granted i know that there will be a last video day one time but i'm grateful we can do this today and i do pray god that uh, you will have our complete attention i won't you will have our complete attention your voice is the only one that matters. So please, speak to us in a way that we understand, in a way that makes sense. Please, may today be a day that's all about you. We want to learn what it really means to have life that's all about you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the Gospel of John. If you happen to have it handy, the very last part of chapter 18, and then sneaking into chapter 19. So the very last part of chapter 18, beginning at verse 38, Jesus is on trial before Pilate. And uh, Pilate's flustered. And anyway, you'll, you'll pick up on that even more in chapter 19. So Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? But before Jesus can even answer it, Pilate disappears. <laughs> Pilate went back outside to the people and said to them, the, the crowd, I cannot find any reason to condemn Jesus. But according to the custom you have, I always set free a prisoner for you during Passover, the special festival they were having, about to have. Do you want me to set free for you the king of the Jews? And they answered him with a shout, No, not him. We want Barabbas. Brackets, Barabbas was a bandit. Okay, now we get into chapter 19, and I just want to say that it needs to be said, this is hard to hear, hard to read, and it should be. I think it would be something wrong with us if, if this were not hard to hear and hard to read, but we need to hear it. So here it is. Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. 
And the soldiers made a crown of thorny branches and put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him and came to him and said, Long live the king of the Jews. And they slapped him. Pilate went back once more and said to the crowd, Look, I will bring him out here to you to let you see what I... But, and I cannot find any reason, he said, to condemn him. So Jesus came out wearing that crown of thorns and purple robe. And Pilate said to them, look, here's the man. And when the chief priests and temple guards saw him, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, you take him then and crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. And the crowd answered back, we have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now when Pilate heard that, he was even more afraid. He went back into the palace and he asked Jesus, where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer. Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Remember, I have the authority to set you free and also to have you crucified. Jesus answered, you have authority over me only because it was given to you by God. So the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a worse sin, Jesus said. When Pilate heard this, he tried to find a way to set Jesus free. But the crowd shouted back, if you set him free, that means you are not the emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the emperor. And when Pilate heard those words, he took Jesus outside and sat down on the judge's seat in the place called the Stone Pavement. And it was almost noon of the day before the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, here is your king. And they shouted back, kill him, kill him, crucify him. And Pilate asked them, do you want me to crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, the only king we have is the emperor. And then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. Yeah. Choices, right? Choices. Um, three young men come to my mind when I think of choices. Um, the first was, the, I won't mention their names but I can still see them very clearly. The first was 16 years old. His parents had abandoned him as a child. And he was living in a home for unwanted or orphaned children. I know, it's heartbreaking, right? But now that he was 16, he was thinking of moving out on his own. And uh, so I met with him a lot before that. And it was an incredible joy when he approached me one day and he said, uh, with this big smile on his face, and I can still see the smile, he said, Bruce, I've decided that I want to be a Christian. And I was, I was elated. I was over the moon. Like, that's all that mattered. And I couldn't hide my enthusiasm. And this young man, not wanting to disappoint me too much, he jumped in. To finish his sentence, I didn't realize, I interrupted his sentence. Bruce, I've decided I want to be a Christian, dot, 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 when I'm 30. I want to live first. I want to live first. Those are his words. And it stayed with me a long, long time because obviously the impression that some Christian people had given, or maybe the church had given, was once you become a Christian, your life is over. There's nothing, there's nothing to smile about anymore. And that must have been the impression. Fun is gone. And so this young man, I'll be a Christian, but I want to live first. Now live from him might have meant I want to live it up first. That was his choice. Second guy was a guy I first met in prison. A number of times, actually. He came back frequently. And it was always for something foolish. And it was always because of drugs. He was always, I mean, he was naturally just a kind and gentle guy. I would go to bat for him any day. But when he was stoned, he just did things, right? Never hurt anybody, by the way. But he did things. 
And uh, the, he had this addiction. So after serving his time on this particular occasion, and I, I know I've shared this before, I saw him out in the pouring rain right around the corner from where we were living in a park, and he had a bag of glue. So the glue was all over him, right? And uh, he was soaked through and through. And I pulled the car, like the same as you would have done. I pulled the car over, and I ran over to him, because I know him. And I urged him, if, if not begged him, just leave the glue on the park bench and come home with me. And my wife will, I know she will have a bed ready for you, and we'll put some coffee on. And uh, my kids will be thrilled to meet. Because he also, by the way, was quite the artist and quite the poet. In fact, he oftentimes uh, drew pictures for me. And I said, my kids would love to see your artwork. And we'll make a warm meal and uh, provide you with a change of clothes because you're soaking wet. But he wouldn't come. He wouldn't let go of that bag. I know it's too easy for me to say it. But he couldn't let go of that bag. Then the third guy comes to my mind. I'd love to mention his name, but I haven't asked his permission. But he's a friend till this very day. Um, he was one of 12 children. His mom had died, and his dad could not cope with so many kids. And so he and many of his siblings, brothers, ended up in that same home alongside the first guy I mentioned who wanted to wait till he was 30 to become a Christian. And if there had been, it's going to sound foolish, but if there had been a contest on who would be the least likely to make something of his life, yeah, it could well have been this third gent. It was hard for me at times to imagine him um, being a man of God. But the day came, and his prayer was a simple one, but it was prayed honestly and fervently, as anyone ever could pray. And it was something like this, Lord, if you will forgive me for how I've lived my life so far, I will live for you. And again, as I mentioned, that young man remains a close friend. He'd, he'd get a kick out of it now being called a young man because he's not much younger than me and I'm not a young man. <laughs> and he's married, employed, and he shares the good news with every opportunity he has and he is the best of dads to his sweet young girl. It's a good news story. Choices, though, right? If someone asked us to define what the passage we just read, put a title on that passage that we just read from John 19, it could just well be the word choice or choices. The choice is made by the crowd, the choice made by the religious leaders, the choice made by the governors, by the soldiers, even the choice made by the closest friends of Jesus. I mean, that day was a day all about choice. And that day makes today all about choice for you and for me. I mean, the most obvious example, perhaps, regarding choice was the opportunity that Pilate presented to the crowd. I mean, all the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all mention this one guy. Barabbas. And if you do a little bit of reading about him, not much, a little bit of reading, comparing the four gospel stories, accounts, this is what you discover about, about Barabbas. In Matthew, he's a notorious prisoner. In Mark, he's a revolutionary, he's revolutionary, in a, and also in Luke. In John, he's a bandit, and he's among the rebels in prison, who has committed murder in the insurrection. Yeah. I mean, the other thing which I think you'll find interesting, if you may know this already, but it's his name, the meaning of his name. It could mean, it could mean one of a few things, but it could mean Barabbas, bar Abbas, son of the father. Interesting. Abba, father, right? bar Abbas. And even more interesting, to me anyway, is the conclusion of many theologians that his first name was actually Jesus. I didn't know that till recently. Jesus Barabbas, son of the Father. Interesting, eh? Not all the ancient manuscripts record him as Jesus Barabbas, but I noticed in the new revised standard, revised version, 
It's Jesus Barabbas. So when Pilate stands before this fickle crowd at the trial of Jesus, I mean, they are confronted with making a choice between Jesus, son of the father who rules by force at the point of the sword and only watches out for himself, or Jesus, son of the father who rules by love and is ready to give himself for the sins of the world. There's the choice before the crowd. An amazing moment. Jesus, an innocent man, about to be murdered, or Barabbas, a murderer, about to be set free. Who will you choose? Pilate says. And I think to his surprise, Barabbas, they cry. And why would they choose Barabbas? Was it a disappointment with Jesus? Remember, there was a crowd. It might not have been the same folk in this picture, but it could have been a bunch of them. A crowd a few days earlier who, you know, chopped down palm branches and laid them out and waved them. Hosanna, celebrating Jesus in a parade, paying homage to him as king. And in that city, we know this is true. In that city, there were people who had been healed by Jesus. People who... Before they met Jesus, they were blind. Now they could see. People who couldn't walk, now they could dance around. People who couldn't hear, now they could hear all this shouting. There was new hope in that city because of Jesus. As they longed for freedom from their oppressors, Rome. But now, perhaps some of those same people see their, what they thought was their conquering hero standing before Pilate broken and beaten. And he won't defend himself. And in their mind, he he can't defeat the enemy. They don't know who the real enemy is. And their loyalty, it's gone. And they get caught up as crowds can do. You probably have seen, I'm sure you've seen it or heard it on television as well. Just get caught up in a frenzy. The craziness of a moment. And do things they never, ever thought they would have done. And say things they never, ever thought they would have said. But they get caught up in it. And that's happened right here in this story. And they choose Barabbas, who live by force. And they turn their backs on the only one who could really set them free. Choices. And there's another choice that really strikes us in this passage as well. And it doesn't involve Pilate, who'd washed his hands, by the way, of the whole matter. You know that. And it doesn't involve the soldiers. It doesn't involve the priests. It doesn't involve the crowds. It doesn't involve his fearful friends. No, it's a choice that was actually made by Jesus that day. And it was a choice to remain obedient to his father and to give his life as a ransom for many. I remember when I first (coughs) gave my life to Christ, And I was reflecting upon this passage and the choice Jesus made in this passage. I scribbled down these words. I guess you could have got up. You could have walked away, left the Roman soldiers behind, washed your holy hands in Pilate's bowl, saying, bye, mankind. But you gave it your all, everything you had. You kept your eyes on the Father above. It wasn't nails or cord that kept you there. Just your wondrous love. I mean, it's been said that Jesus is more ready to love than we are to be loved. And he's more ready to forgive than we are to be forgiven. <clears throat> I remember sharing last time we met like this that the gospel is meant to be understood by all. And if the gospel could not be understood by all, then it's not good news for all. But it's meant to be even the youngest of us should be able to understand something, the core, what what really matters about what Jesus was all about that day. So I remember drawing some little pictures like this, and they're really lame. My my drawing, like, I'm almost embarrassed to show you, but but just with kids, right? This is construction paper that belongs to my grandkids, actually. But just explain that the way life is meant to be, uncluttered, clean, free, beautiful. And yet... As much as we wish it could always stay that way, it doesn't. Things start sneaking into our life that we never 
imagine would, but they do, whether we're young or whether we're old guys like me. Things like hate, and we never thought that would happen, but it does. Things like anger, the wrong kind of anger, not righteous anger, you know, kind of self-centered anger. That sneaks in. In fact, I often ask kids, you want to fill some more words in? What other words come to your mind? And sometimes words like jealousy, even for children, right? And pride and envy and words like lust and words like lies. And uh, in that last one, when I was a kid, that was the doozy for me. I remember as a nine-year-old kid, just before I was going to bed one day, just stopping and, and saying to my, to my parents, I said, Mom and Dad, uh, I didn't lie today. And I was shocked that I didn't lie. It was the first time I could remember. I Because I would lie and then cover up a lie by lying and cover up my other lie by lying. It, I mean, it's, it's horrible, right? But that was how, yeah. So I could relate to uh, the mess. But then I asked kids, so what does this have to do with any of that? What does this have to do with all those words you just mentioned to me? And oftentimes, because kids can be wonderfully honest, they say, I haven't got a clue what that means. Well, I, here's what it means. <clears throat> For all those times you lost it, when you shouldn't have lost it, Jesus says, I forgive you because I love you. For all the times you hated in ways that you're not supposed to hate. Jesus says, I forgive you because I love you. For all the times you've been jealous, for all that pride, for all the envy, for all the lust, for all those lies as a nine-year-old kid or as a nine-year-old, I forgive you because I love you. And then what happens? It's forgiven, and it's forgotten, and it's gone. And life can now begin the way it's meant to be, centered around, right in the middle, Christ. Making all things new, starting afresh. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, Dwight Moody was quite the evangelist back in the 1800s, and he was contemplating the cross and the resurrection of Jesus and he imagined this scene. I love this. He said, imagine Jesus gathering all of his disciples, you know, after the resurrection, together in Jerusalem and saying, men, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and find those priests who mocked me and who, who hurled insults at me and said things like he saved others, but he couldn't save himself. I want you to explain to them that if I had saved myself, they would have been doomed. But tell them there now is a way wide open and they're welcome to come. It's interesting to read in the book of Acts, the book that follows the book of John in your Bible, that as a result of hearing the good news, we read a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Interesting, eh? I love that. And Moody goes on in his imagination, uh, imagining Jesus saying this to his disciples, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and find those soldiers who cast lots for my garment, for my seamless robe. And I want you to tell them that there's something far greater than, far greater treasure than a seamless robe awaiting them. It'll be a spotless heart if they come. And their guilt can be just washed away. And their callous cruelty can be forgiven if they just come. And then he said, I want you to find that centurion who thrust that spear into my side. And I want you to tell them, there's a closer way to my heart if he will just come as a sinner, ready to be forgiven. Isn't that something? I mentioned that when I first gave my life to Christ, um, I scribbled down some words. Here's some more of that same. Since you died for me, I will live for you. To my world, I will say goodbye. Since you gave me your life, it's the least I can do. Jesus, help me try. I know it's going to be rough. I know there's going to be pain. I know there's going to be days to cry. But if you give me a boost every now and again, we'll be doing fine. So those first three guys I mentioned, 
I, I want to, I choose to be a Christian, but not yet. <laughs> Much later on. Mm-hmm. The second guy. The addiction. The third guy. A wake-up call. Never turn back to this very day. I just want to share that today is also a day of decision, a day of choice. What will you do with Jesus? My choice? I can hold on to my sin and let it hold on to me because that's what it does. I think I'm in control. I'm not. It is. I can let it pull me down. I can let it tear me apart. I can let it keep love and forgiveness at a distance, far off distance. I can let it mess up my life, my mind, my heart, my relationships. People can suffer because of my decision to let it stay in my life. And ultimately, not to make anybody afraid, but you got to hear it, I can choose to say no to God forever and live without God forever in eternity without him. I can choose that, an eternity without God. Or, thankfully, there's another option behind door number two. I can confess and forsake my sin. I can, I can be set free from its power. This is so... Please listen to this. I can be set, you can be set free from the power of sin. It thinks it's your boss. It's not any longer. You can be set free from the penalty of sin. And one day, be set free from the very presence of sin. Isn't that something? Hard for me to imagine the last one, but it's coming. It's coming. And you can know today what it means to belong and to live for the one who gave his life for you. As I've shared many times with children and with people older than me, if there's room in your heart for Jesus, there's room in his home for you. Yeah. So, John 19, choice, decision. And our decision, right, should be obvious. I mean, it should wave like a banner over our lives, over our homes, over places like I'm sitting in right now. Despite what fickle crowds may scream and holler and say to us we choose Jesus and we choose him now and we choose him forever a song that comes to mind before this video runs out of time based on John chapter 19 and a little further and the hammer fell on the wooden nail Threw his flesh into the tree And they laughed at him As he died for them And there he hung The faultless one And didn't he live Oh, didn't he Didn't he give, oh, didn't he? And didn't he die for you and me? Spilled his precious blood, sacrifice of love. We didn't take his life from him, he gave it willingly, fulfilled the prophecy. What's black is white, what's wrong is right, and didn't he live, oh, didn't he? Didn't he give, oh, didn't he? And didn't he die for you and me?
bugler blow that horn Now the curtain's torn And the battle's done, I know The victory's won So drummer, drum that drum He broke the chains The lamb is slain Now doesn't he live Oh, doesn't he Doesn't he give Oh, doesn't he And didn't he die For you and me Well, thank you for today, and I do pray that when it comes to choice, that each of us will choose Christ and invite him to make all the difference in our circle, in our life, all the difference, to say no to what is wrong and to say yes to what is right, not to be held in bondage by what would take us down, but to embrace what would give us life. I pray that in Jesus' name for you and for all of us who are listening. God bless you big time. Please don't hesitate to be in touch. Okay.